It's time. We are not called to be nice. Sandy Rios. Welcome, Sandy. Thanks for being here. We are often called to be confrontational. And here with me in D.C. is Fox News contributor Sandy Rios. You and you still like me? Or you, or you don't like me, James? Are you okay? You all right? <laughs> I'm a musician. I can't help it. Uh, longtime Fox News contributor Sandy Rios, thanks very much for being with us. We have, I think it's four to one youth in America wants gay marriage. Our kids are the product of public schools. No wonder they poll the way they do. It's time to stand up or we're going to lose everything we have. Director of Governmental Affairs for the American Family Association. Step up, speak up, say something, do something. This isn't a game. This is real life. Sandy Rios is with the American Family Association. A pro-life radio talk show host. Some things are worth fighting for. A young man's first shave is a milestone, and for transgender man Samson Brown, it was memorable for seven years. Happening. Was someone pushing this? How, how does a, a corporation which uh, sells products to all Americans are often called to be confrontational? And here with me in D.C. is Fox News contributor Sandy Rios. You and you still like me, or you, or you don't like me, James? Are you okay? You all right? <laughs> I'm a musician. I can't help it. Uh, longtime Fox News contributor Sandy Rios, thanks very much for being with us. We have, I think it's four to one youth in America wants gay marriage. Our kids are the product of public schools. No wonder they poll the way they do. It's time to stand up or we're going to lose everything we have. Director of Governmental Affairs for the American Family Association. Step up, speak up, say something, do something. This isn't a game. This is real life. Sandy Rios is with the American Family Association. A pro-life radio talk show host. Some things are worth fighting for. A young man's first shave is a milestone, and for transgender man Samson Brown, it was memorable for several reasons. Now, don't be scared. Don't be scared. Shaving is about being confident. Brown shared this experience with his father in an ad for Gillette. The video shows Brown standing in front of a bathroom mirror as his father coaches him. Gillette shared the video with the caption, Whenever, wherever, however it happens, your first shave is special. It now has close to a million views. Gillette had another socially relevant ad earlier this year. Its We Believe ad addressed several issues like toxic masculinity, sexual harassment, and Me Too. All right, so that was a report by CNN, which uh, kind of spelled out how Gillette has continued to move to the left. Many people were shocked when they did that uh, advertisement during the Super Bowl uh, about this, you know, idea that uh, men were changing. They didn't need to be quite as masculine as Gillette had portrayed them in past ads. Well, where did we get to this, where corporate America is now joining uh, the far left in propagandizing America and stigmatizing traditional views and values. Uh, I can tell you, I remember my first intersection with this was way back uh, in the 90s when United Airlines, which was bla- based in San Francisco, was the first major airline to embrace LGBT, well, the T wasn't there yet, uh, lesbian and gay priorities. And they started implementing, you know, b- uh, benefits for same-sex partners. That was, of course, before gay marriage, a long time before gay marriage. But let me tell you, that was very controversial and, of course, United took the lead, and then other airlines followed. And so if you wonder why there are so many um, uh, gay and lesbian, uh, mostly gay men, who are flight attendants, and why there are so many uh, transgender pilots, and, yes, there are a lot of transgender pilots, is because the airlines uh, jumped onto that bandwagon from pressure, uh, the pressure of uh, United uh, leading the way because of the environment they were in in San Francisco. And that's kind of how I remember this whole thing starting. But since that time, and in the last few years, we have seen really a burst of growth in the plunge to the left of corporate America, whether it's uh, Pepsi or Starbucks or Nike featuring Colin Kaepernick uh, in one of their major advertising platforms, or Target, which AFA has uh, boycotted because of opening their dressing rooms to... Uh, regardless of gender, letting anyone use them, we could go on and on. So how how did this happen? Why is this happening? Was someone pushing this? How how does a a corporation which uh, sells products to all Americans suddenly decide to embrace uh, the views, the social views of the left? Well, someone that knows a great deal about this and is actually on the front lines of trying to push back is Justin Danhoff. Justin is the director of the Free Enterprise Project for the National Center for Public Policy Research, and he joins us this morning. Good morning, Justin. Hey, 
Hey, good morning, Sandy. Thanks for having me on. You know, I would, uh, maybe it would be interesting to have you describe. I, I opened up and said kind of what I know in overview, but how would you describe in broad terms what's happening in corporate boardrooms in America? Well, you had um, the word in your opening statement that is the most important is pressure. And companies are actually quite amenable to pressure campaigns. And there's good reasons for that because publicly traded companies actually are responsible to their shareholders and their stakeholders and their investors. And so when they receive pressure from those groups, they are kind of forced to respond. And when you think about the broad sphere of how policy and culture gets changed, we have a political landscape, but we also have this business landscape that's very influential on the culture. And when you think about where pressure can be applied, most congressmen in this country live in a gerrymandered, dis- gerrymandered district, right? They're very hard to pressure on any issue because they know they're going to win re-election. Same with lots of senators in this country. And so one of the main reasons, well, there's three reasons that I've always said that the left has used corporate America so effectively as a tool, and that is the first point, is that corporations are much more amenable to pressure than most politicians in this country. Secondly, corporations, they can move much more quickly than the political process. Think how long um, uh, uh, it takes to get a new federal law on the books. They can also move uh, much more quickly than the legal process. Cases drag out for years, decades sometimes. Um, So then corporations, they're much quicker to affect change. And third, and this is where it's truly weaponized, and the left has become really, really good at this, really good. And we need to start copying some of their methods that companies can have a direct economic impact on a very specific and targeted region. When you talk about boycotts, when you talk about corporate investment in certain states, you know, look at what we saw with both Apple and Amazon over the last two years when they're talking about adding new locations to certain regions. You had almost every city in the country bending over backwards economically to try and get Amazon's HQ2 into their uh, location, right? Mm -hmm. And that's because they know the effect that it can have on a specific targeted region. And the same can be said of companies that will refuse to do business in a certain state because of a policy uh, or a law that is going to be put in place. And so the left weaponizes um, corporate America very much in that way. But When it comes to pressure, we're not there. This is my point. I am a a conservative shareholder activist. I, at the Free Enterprise Project, we go after companies on a broad array of issues, wherever we see them diminishing liberty, where they're diminishing religious liberty, uh, where they're they're advancing, um, you know, universal Medicare for all or, you know, and everywhere in between. We step in. But in any given year, there's between 70 and 90 groups on the left that do the same thing. And not only that, they've been doing it for decades. So, you know, one, one thing I like to orient folks to think about is that we've been losing corporate America since about the Vietnam War era. So we're not going to win them back tomorrow, but we better start trying. You know, just one one specific question, Justin, that I don't understand. Uh, with Target, let me just pick on Target just for a second. Uh, you said earlier that boards, you know, are supposed to oversee the activities of uh, the corporation and to make sure that their decisions go to the benefit of the shareholders. And I think there are laws that kind of, I mean, uh, 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 A board can't make decisions that will cause people to lose money who are shareholders. I think that would be against the rules, I'm thinking. And so that's the thing that puzzles me is like, for instance, in the case of Target, which American Family Association has boycotted and their stocks did go down and they did suffer financially because of the boycott. They probably still are, although I can't quantify that in this moment. But I know that we did quantify it uh, a year or so after we started the boycott. Uh, but Target refused to budge. Isn't that a breach of their own rules that they would lose money and ignore uh, the bottom line for their shareholders? 
Yeah, so that's just the rub, right, is they do have a fiduciary responsibility to their investors, but it's such an amorphous area of the law that it's almost impossible to um, causate or correlate directly a specific action with a stock price drop or what have you. Because, again, there was uh, an economic negative bounce for a while, but I can tell you Target stock's doing okay now, um, unfortunately. So um, we need your boycott, but guess what we needed? 50 other groups to join on with it. And that's what the left does. That's my point. If you wanted to actually drive down the stock price to show that this policy is such an insane policy. And believe me, I confronted Brian Cornell at the shareholder meeting two years ago after this occurred. Um, and he, he steadfastly stood with his ridiculous policy that he put in place. Um, and so, yeah, that's you bring up a good issue, but we needed 50 more boycotts to uh, join your effort for there to be an actual ability to bring it's called a shareholder derivative lawsuit where the board's in violation of their fiduciary duty. So it needs to be a larger uh, groundswell effort. And, you know, that's why I, I love that you, you have me on today to talk about um, basically we just need to reverse engineer what the left does. Yeah. We just need to build out the army that they have. And my other message to conservatives and Christians is always this. If the left can do it, it can't be that hard. It can't be that hard. Well, that's encouraging in a sort of negative way. <laughs> you know, um, Justin, uh, when a, co- a company makes a decision like this, uh, how do they come to that? I mean, it, it is, does boil down to the people that are selected to be on the board, doesn't it? And who chooses them? So it's, it's, a, it's a top-down, bottom-up issue, right? And so there's a couple of, there's a couple of major factors involved here, and you know I can I can set the broad landscape. But when I talk to companies, and I've had over 250 meetings just over the last five years with high-level corporate executives on many of these issues that we're talking about today, I hear a refrain that is so consistent. I I, I can't even tell you. I hear it from almost every company. Well, we're doing this because this is what our employees want us to do. So, for example, all of the companies that fund the, the, I think they're a hate group, but the human rights campaign um, that is very virulently Mm -hmm. anti-religious, I've I've heard that refrain from them. I've heard that from Target uh, regarding their their bathroom policy. I've heard it on a wide array of environment, social issues, and the like. And so what I think that speaks to, that's the bottom-up part, is... Employees at corporations, at major corporations in this country with left-wing worldviews, they feel emboldened and empowered to speak up and pressure management from within. To say, these, you know, we want you to fund Planned Parenthood. We don't want you to fund a crisis pregnancy center. And those who work in that company, who would think completely the opposite, that funding Planned Parenthood is abhorrent, and we should fund a crisis pregnancy center in our neighborhood, they stay silent. So what I've seen is essentially the extension of the American college campus into corporate America, where conservative viewpoints are seen as bigoted and hateful. And so conservatives just, you know, in college, they just go to class, put their head down, do their homework, you know, get up, repeat. And they don't speak out on campus generally. I mean, there are exceptions, but as a general rule, you know, college campuses lean dramatically to the left. And now that same feeling has transferred to corporate America. So that's the bottom-up problem. Uh, Conservatives don't feel empowered to speak up in the workplace. The top-down problem, which you were asking about, is that boards of directors have started to be cherry-picked and hand-picked by certain search firms and certain um, former Obama administration officials that are actively working to turn the corporate boards into liberal social justice warriors as well. Um, Eric Holder is involved in this process. And again, the search for it. And I'm told by, you know, some of the friendly corporations that I deal with that they're, when, when they go to these search firms, they are handpicking basically all 
slates of liberal individuals for them to fill on their boards of directors. Wow. And well, that so explains a lot. We've got a top-down problem that we're not addressing. There's no conservative search firms out there identifying, you know, former um, conservative senators or whatever that can be on board. Um, and we have, I don't, and this is, I don't have a solution for this problem other than to empower individual folks, but we've got, we've got to get the message out that conservative voices shouldn't be silent in corporations. Justin, we're going to, and we'll continue with that. We'll continue with that right after this. We have so many stories to tell you about what companies are doing and Justin's confrontation of them when we return Sandy Rios in the morning on AFR Talk. Sandy Rios in the morning on American Family Radio. Sandy Rios back with you. My guest is uh, Justin Danhoff. Justin is the director of the Free Enterprise Project for the National Center for Public Policy Research. And we actually haven't even gotten into what Justin actually does. Trust me, he has a ton of courage. And you're going to appreciate that when we finish this discussion. But just to follow up, Justin, for a second before we transition into what you actually do. You just told us uh, that there's a group of uh, liberal, there's like a, a, a search firm, a headhunting company that seems uh, to involve Eric, Hol- Eric Holder and probably other members of the left who are strategically placing board members who are leftists at these various boards. And then you have this influx of employees who are products of colleges and universities and so that there's a, there's a two-pronged shift in points of view. And uh, before I play this next clip, I just would be curious to know if you were to describe what you think is the most successful campaign of the left to take over the ideological bent of a company, what would that be? What would that look like? Um, Probably their environmental campaigns. They've already won on the climate change hysteria issue. Every single company in America now that's a Fortune 500 company has a sustainability offer, officer, sustainability campaign, um, and they spend significant wasted resources on green tech, green energy, and the like. I, we, we basically lost that battle probably a decade ago. And um, believe me, they're still trying to spike the ball and push it even further, basically forcing companies to themselves adopt the Paris Climate Agreement. And many of them have done so. So the U.S. left the Paris Climate Accord, then, you know, thank President Trump for that. But companies now are willfully adopting the the mission of the Paris Climate Accord. It's, it's mind-boggling to watch it happen, but I see it happen every day. So, Justin, you have, as you said, you've had like 250 meetings, you said, just this year. And I know that doesn't mean that you have necessarily... Some of the things that you have done have been public, and we're actually going to give people an example of that with companies that they're very familiar with. So kind of give them an idea of uh, what it is you're doing, and then I'm going to play some audio from your interaction at a Starbucks board meeting. Can you tell us? Yeah, so it's really exciting what I do. So basically what we did at the Free Enterprise Project was we took a look at two specific tools that the left has been using for decades, and those are shareholder proposals, and shareholder meetings. And shareholder proposals uh, for a while didn't get a lot of attention, but I saw from behind the scenes how powerful they were in moving companies to the left. And it's for one simple reason that you know most Americans don't realize, is that corporations generally hate shareholder proposals so much that they're willing to negotiate with you for policy changes if you file a resolution that they don't like. So I'll give, I, I give two anecdotes quickly to let people know how powerful these things are. Four years ago, I filed a shareholder resolution with Coca-Cola. I own only $3,000 worth of Coca-Cola stock, mind you. I don't have you know tens of millions of dollars of Coca-Cola stock. I filed the resolution. 45 minutes later, the general counsel and the head of investor relations called my cell phone directly, and they had one question. They said, Justin, what can we negotiate this year to get this proposal off the proxy? And so that is what the left has realized is the power of negotiation from filing a shareholder proposal. So it took us a while to realize that, and we've now been building that up. And I file about 20 proposals a year and then follow up with negotiations and try and affect policy changes at companies. And we've been very successful in doing so. 
because we stole the model from the left. Hey, but Justin, again, be- before you launch working it- 80 hours a week, I can file 20 of these. The left can file 500 a year if they want. Let me just uh, jump in before you get to part two. Because uh, the proxy, people that hold stocks, and a lot of people do, or they have, uh, through their 401k, they are they hold stocks at various companies, and they will get these proxy uh, things in the mail, and you <laughs> you have to decide. Most people just toss them. But you're talking about that, where these questions come before the actual uh, shareholders. If they would just take responsibility, then you're saying that you have managed to get to negotiate some of the questions that the stockholders would vote on, or shareholders would vote on, and that that can actually move the ball along. People will actually look at their proxy ballot and vote. Now, it helped me. I know that wasn't as clear as it should have been, so make it clearer for me. Yeah, absolutely. So um, most folks, you're right, just grab their proxy cards, whether they get them via email or snail mail, and either click delete or throw them in the trash can. But what happens then is that your votes are oftentimes, depending on the company, most times they're voted for you, okay? And they're voted against every interest you could possibly believe in. And that's because there are proxy advisor services. So if you have like a mutual fund, for example, which, you know that's how a lot of folks have their investments, right? The proxy advisor services in this country, again, dramatically left-leaning organizations. So they support every liberal proposal that is on that proxy statement and your mutual fund advisor will just go along with these uh, suggestions. So they, they make suggestions to the mutual fund advisor, vote for all these liberal proposals. And by the way, comma, vote against all of Justin's proposals uh, because they share a left wing worldview. And so again, we don't have any proxy advisors in the conservative movement, any proxy advisors on the right telling folks, No, 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 no. These liberal groups are like antithetical to capitalism. They have no interest in these companies. You know, pardon the pun, but these liberal groups use the use companies as a proxy, basically just to achieve their social justice outcome. They don't actually have any interest in the company itself. Um, I mean, when we talk about the left and their position on the economy these days, most of these folks, like Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. they would prefer that states control the industry, that the federal government controls most industry, and these companies would all just disappear anyway. So that's, in, in a broad sense, yes, people need to start actively voting their shares because they're getting voted for you against your own interest. Okay, and then the second thing that you do, this is what, where you ha- there are so many great stories here. I want to make sure we get to them. You have a lot of guts. I said that already, Justin, because... I want to paint the picture. You go into these meetings, and of course, there's at these big companies, there are a lot of people in these meetings. So it's like a big auditorium uh, with uh, the the, uh, CEO and the board members on the stage, and you go up to the microphone, and I want to give them an example. This was at a Starbucks meeting. I think this was this year, wasn't it? Yep. Yep. Okay, and this is how it sounds. Let's listen. The fourth item of business is the shareholder proposal submitted by the National Center for Public Policy Research regarding board diversity disclosure. I would now like to recognize Mr. Justin Danoff, a representative of the National Center for Public Policy Research. Out of respect for other shareholders in attendance and to allow ample time for Q&A, we'd ask you, Mr. Danoff, to please limit your comments to a period of three minutes. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. My name is Justin Danhoff, General Counsel with the National Center for Public Policy Research, and I rise to move Proposal 4, which seeks to increase the ideological diversity within the company's board of directors. Across corporate America, company after company is adopting board diversity policies that are based on race and gender. These procedures have the stated goal of reducing corporate groupthink. That's a good goal. But it does so by requiring companies to interview an underrepresented minority and a woman for each open board seat. This isn't what diversity is. This is actually racism and sexism. Not all women think alike based on the fact that they're a woman. Similarly, not all Asian or Latino or black Americans think the same 
based on their respective skin colors. Rather than promoting racism and sexism today, we urge the company to consider viewpoint diversity. That is people that actually think differently when they make board selections. Through the years, especially under its former CEO, Mr. Schultz, Starbucks earned a well-worn reputation for being a left of center company. Under Schultz, the company stake left his positions on immigration, religious liberty, climate, and had a dicey relationship with certain racial issues. Interestingly, now that he is considering a presidential run, Schultz has been met with scorn by the liberals whom he supported and promoted for years, since he is the B and the C word, that is a billionaire that believes in capitalism. Many of today's leftists in Washington, D.C. prefer socialism, in which government takes control of industry and would regulate capitalism out of existence. Raise your hand here if you want government-run coffee or Starbucks coffee. I think most people would raise their hand for Starbucks coffee. And forget about the share buybacks that the CFO talked about earlier. Those would be gone under the new leftist wave in D.C. too. Yet Starbucks liberal, liberal convictions remain intact. And even if the company disagrees with that assertion, in business, all too often, perception is reality. Our proposal offers the company a concrete way to change its left-leaning public persona. When the company engages and takes overtly political positions on legal and policy issues, it would be a benefit, not a harm, to have voices from both sides of the aisle in the room. That's what our proposal seeks to ensure. All right, I'm going to interrupt. Uh, that's Justin. That's just part of it. That's how it started. Uh, Justin, what was the axe that you had to grind with Starbucks? What was the particular? You, what, give us an example of some of their egregious policies. Yeah, so, I mean, first of all, they've got one of these board policies in place that we consider to be racist and sexist, right? We, again, as I pointed out, it's a noble goal to try and avoid groupthink but it's an igno ignoble way to go about it by mandating that you in interview a woman and an underrepresented minority to avoid that group thing. Uh, we've got a company, I mean, that publicly came out against pre President Trump's tax reform. For goodness sake, it helped their lower and middle income employees more than anyone else, yet the company's leadership was opposed to it. The company's leadership was opposed to President Trump's orders on immigration and travel. So our point being, that what our proposal did was actually give them a good business opportunity. I know personally, I don't drink at Starbucks. I know many conservatives have no, and Christians have no interest in drinking coffee at Starbucks. And when it comes to these big national issues where Starbucks is staking out a position on a political issue, it's clear there's no conservatives that have any power in leadership, that, that you know, no one's listening to them if they exist. And so our point is, even if you want to deny it, which, of course, many, many of these companies deny their left-leaning bias, right? So you go ahead and deny it, Starbucks. But I'm giving you a business opportunity. If you appointed, like, say, just two really high-profile conservative individuals to the board of directors, well, that would go a long way to say, hey, wait a minute, maybe Starbucks is trying to balance itself out. Maybe going forward, they're not going to be taking these overtly left-wing political positions that actually have nothing to do with Starbucks' bottom line. And so perhaps there is a better future for Starbucks, and they'll get out of the culture wars, because that's part of our message at the Free Enterprise Project. What do these companies have to do with the culture battles? When it has nothing to do with your business, get out of the culture battles altogether, I'm not even suggesting they come join in, you know, the worldview that you and I might hold, Sandy. I'm just suggesting they get out of the way, that they don't have a place in those battles. And in many of the instances that I just discussed, Starbucks doesn't have a place. And so if their board was balanced, my guess is, my guess is they would stake out either no position or a neutral position on many of these issues. And I think that that opens them up to a larger clientele base of conservatives that have for years had wanted nothing to do with Starbucks coffee. Yep. So I was actually putting, it, putting a proposal forward that is pro-business for Starbucks 
and they still rejected it. Yeah, I was going to say, and the bottom line is they rejected it very roundly. They rejected your proposal. And you uh, just about a week or so before that or around that time, you actually also went to the board meeting for Twitter. I'd love to hear about that one. What was your experience like with them? Yeah, so it, it's pretty interesting in that, you know, Jack Dorsey is one of the few CEOs that will admit that there is a bias within his company. I think this is like a shocking thing. But, you know, Jack Dorsey admits, like, yes, our office is in Silicon Valley. Yes, we have a, you know, a largely left-leaning uh, workforce. But then there's always the but. They continue to claim that the platform is not biased against conservatives. However... You know, we can go through all the anecdotal evidence we want because we all know the anecdotes out there that it's largely um, conservatives that are taken down. But actually, a Ph.D. uh, candidate at Columbia ran through the numbers. And of the 22 main political figures that have been deplatformed from Twitter, uh, and those individuals were people that expressed support in the 2016 election one way or the other, 21 of the 22 were people that expressed support for President Trump. So they can deny it, but 21 out of 22 is a pretty strong sample. Um, But interestingly enough, you know, one thing we do is we get results and we get impact. And I want to talk to you about that. Justin, hold that thought. I want to find out because that's... (laughs) I want a few more examples because you've gone to Amazon, you've gone to uh, Bank of America... Uh, um, AT&T. There's just some really fascinating stories here that I'd like for us to sprinkle in, but I do want to know if you've had any success, uh, if you've had any experience besides people booing you and having you sit down and rejecting you. It'd be nice to know if you had any kind of sex success whatsoever. Justin Danhoff is the director of the Free Enterprise Project, and we'll be right back after this, Sandy Rios, in the morning on AFR Talk. Don't forget to connect with Sandy Rios in the morning on Facebook or email Sandy at Sandy at AFR.net. That's Sandy at AFR.net. Sandy Rios in the morning on American Family Radio. Last year was uh, when United, uh, after the Parkland shooting, decided to sever ties with the NRA. And so we questioned him back in 2018 saying, why did you do this? And he said it was a personal decision. And that was criticized by financial experts, as well as criticized um, by people in his company. Uh, Inc.com did a story where they found out that uh, four to one, uh, United employees were against the idea to to cut ties. And those that that did were probably against the NRA in the first place. So we went this year to say, hey, would you like to possibly change your mind? Would you like to explain why you felt as CEO you could make a personal decision? And he doubled down saying that uh, we took him out of context and he was talking about the uh, he was making a personal decision as the head of the United family um, to which I was asking him what other things he might do in the future. And he was not happy to hear that that kind of questioning. That was David Almasi, who's also with the Free Enterprise Project. And Justin Danhoff is our guest today. That was United. Of course, I mentioned United Airlines in the opening, uh, Justin, but it's true that so much of corporate America has gone after the gun industry with a vengeance. What can you say about that? Yeah, so interestingly enough, <clears throat> you know, I confronted United last year. David confronted them this year. And I wanted to give you some anecdotes on impact, though. And circling back on Twitter just really briefly, three days after I went after them for deplatforming conservatives and largely only conservatives, two uh, well-known liberals who push fake news regularly, just true fake news, were deplatformed from Twitter. So when you confront these guys, sometimes you get some action. Interesting. Um, so that, <laughs> that's, that's one thing. And when it comes to the gun issue, you're right. About 20 companies last year following the Parkland shooting distanced themselves from the NRA or otherwise gave the Second Amendment a black guy. One of those companies was Bank of America. Bank of America, following Parkland, said we have a, came out with a new policy that said we will no longer give loans 
to any gun manufacturer that makes quote unquote assault style rifles, which Remington is one of these companies that was no longer eligible for Bank of America loan. Because when they come after conservatives, when they come after us, they come after our speech and our money because speech and money are similar, right? They try and debank us and deplatform us because they don't want to hear from us. Well, I went to the Bank of America shareholder meeting and I asked CEO Brian Moynihan a very pointed question. I said, first, based on this political decision that you just made, can you tell all of us investors in the room how much money we stand to lose? Because after all, this is an investor's meeting. It's a shareholder meeting, how much money we're going to lose. And then I had a second piece of information. A week before the meeting, I was watching CNBC when Warren Buffett was being interviewed. And the host asked him what he thought of all of these companies making these political anti-NRA decisions. His exact quote is that he thought it was ridiculous, that that's not the role of business. It's certainly not the role of a CEO to place his personal politics on the heads of all of the employees and the shareholders. And so that was the second part of my question. I said, who has it right, Warren Buffett or you? <laughs> Do you know who happens to be the largest shareholder of Bank of America? It's none other than Warren Buffett's Berkshire wow. Hathaway. Wow. Less so what did they say? Four weeks later, less than four. Well, his answer was ridiculous, political grandstanding. Um, but less than four weeks later, Bank of America did indeed make a major loan to Remington. Wow. They reversed their policy wow. based on a question. So the power of a question, the power of showing up, like, you know, the conservative Twitter, you know, conservatives all over their blogs and Facebooks, everyone was so angry at these corporations that had taken this anti-Second Amendment stance. And let me tell you, that's fine. Venture frustration in a blog, an op-ed, what have you. But it's the power of showing up that gets change. It's the power of showing up that gets impact and results. And so that's the message that I want all your listeners to take away is show up. Let the companies hear from you. Even if you're just sending an email, let them hear from you. If, you, if you're making a phone call um, and if you do have the courage to come confront them, you know, reach out to me at nationalcenter.org. Uh, track us down on Facebook. I will give you the tools. I will, I, will, I will give you some courage and some support in how to do what I do. Uh, because it shouldn't just me be us at the Free Enterprise Project being a lone voice in the wilderness on these issues. You know, uh, let me just repeat, nationalcenter.org. We'll put that on our Facebook page so that you can reference it. I also want to put an article on that uh, Justin wrote. I think it was an investor's, no, it was in The Federalist. It's called, In Gun Debate, Big Business Lines Up Yet Again as Left's Guns for Hire. It'll just give you an idea and some more details uh, in the gun issue about this. Now, Justin, just for our own interest, you uh, there are other companies that you've confronted, and I'm just I want to hear these stories. Amazon, for instance, you went to Amazon's board meeting um, just in May of this last year. Week. So, yeah, yeah, so what? Yeah, yeah, last week. Okay, so tell us about that. So this is, you know, the liberal enclave of Seattle, um, and they had the most shareholder proposals of any publicly traded company this year. So I had to sit for about a half an hour and listen to. Um, a liberal on the environmental issue cry, <laughs> literally cry, and claim that Amazon is killing the earth with climate change somehow and that Amazon itself must fix climate change. This was interesting. There was three liberal proposals demanding, demanding that they stop selling facial recognition software to police because, of course, the police are racist and the software is doubly racist, so it's you know triple racism or something once you do the math. I, I don't know. It's, not, it's complete nonsense. What's my point about talking about the liberals? They had 11 proposals at Amazon. Amazon's already a left-leaning company. The liberals are never satisfied, and they're in the room in droves. Why are we not? We should be outnumbering the liberals at these far-left companies, pushing them back to neutral. But the, again, they're never satisfied. They're never satiated. They keep going. So I presented the. It was a very similar proposal to what I presented at Starbucks that you played earlier my calls for diversity, because again, Amazon has one of these, what I call racist and sexist diversity board policies in place. And Amazon takes a lot of left-leaning public positions. So when I got up and I explained that Amazon's policy is racism and sexism, that diversity of thought and viewpoint should be 
embraced, this was some of the loudest booing and heckling I've ever received at a shareholder meeting. Think about that. All I'm doing is calling for diversity of thought, and the left can't stand that. I was heckled, I was booed, I was called a Klan member, a Nazi, and then on the way out the door, um, one of the liberals who presented another shareholder proposal said I should hurry up because I'm probably late for my next book burning. Think about the vitriol Mm. that comes from these folks. It's amazing that, you know, they never, and I mean ever, hear a conservative thought. And, you know, to, to hear it one time a year puts them into such a petulant stage that that's the result. And again, so that, that, that <laughs> I say that not to say it's about me, but it's about, again, the power of showing up because Amazon adopted their racist and sexist board policy because the last couple of years, the left has been in the room demanding it. At the meeting, again, this year, they're crying about, you know, Amazon and the carbon footprint. Amazon announced like seven new initiatives to try and get to carbon neutral, right? (laughs) So the left is getting results because they're, you know, they're the barbarians at the gates. And once they break through the gate, they keep pounding away. They are not satisfied. You know, one thing that you brought out in that board meeting with Amazon is that uh, Amazon is a supporter of and uses information from the SPLC, the Southern Poverty Law Center, which, of course, you can imagine I've talked about a great deal at this microphone, so we don't need to explain that too much, except they are the group that uh, lists hate groups for us. They gather all this information helpfully to show that uh, groups like the American Family Association, Family Research Council are hate groups. So Amazon actually uses their list uh, to, uh, to target people and also to pe- keep people out of the Amazon Smile Charitable Program. That. That surprised me, Justin, because the SPLC really has fallen into some some sort, at least, of disrepute. If you've been listening to any news or uh, staying aware, evidently Amazon didn't get the, the message on that. And did you have any, any luck at all with them, or did they roundly reject everything? So they roundly rejected it. And, I mean, when it comes to the SPLC and corporate America, what what is amazing to me, Sandy, is that this is a growing problem, not a shrinking problem. It seems like every week I come across another headline or someone shoots me an email to say, hey, did you see this company's now working with the Southern Poverty Law Center too? And my point with this is this needs to be one of the conservative and Christian movement's biggest campaigns. Amazon is the head of the snake on this. And companies follow other leading companies. And for better or worse, and mostly for worse, Amazon is the you know biggest company in the country right now. And the fact that they also let the Southern Poverty Law Center profit from the Amazon Smile program while keeping good family and Christian groups off of the Amazon Smile program, this is more than just some partnership. This is true money um, exchanging hands, and we we need to coalesce and continue to work on this. Um, I heck. I brought this issue up to Jeff Bezos all the way back in 2015, and we're still fighting on it. But here, again, go back to one of my original comments for those who feel frustrated and feel like you can't have change. Believe me, you can. It doesn't take a lot, but we need to start. Again, we've been losing corporate America since the Vietnam War era. We aren't going to win them back tomorrow, but we're never going to win them back if we're not engaged in the battles. Yes, and that's the point that you're making and we're taking. Uh, people need to pay attention to this. And let me just, again, say that they can find out more about what you're doing. Um, they can follow you at Free Enterprise, Free Int, E-N-T Project, at Free Int Project on Twitter, and it's nationalcenter.org. One last thing that we need to just mention, Dustin, you have uh, discovered that there is a ton of money behind this effort, a concerted amount of money, behind this effort to overtake corporate America. Can you say something about that? Oh, yeah. Like I said earlier, just in the shareholder proposal sphere, there's about 70 to 90 groups on the left that are active. And to put it in perspective, one just one group in this movement, CalPERS, they have $320 billion in assets under management. That's a lot of influence. And guess what? 
they are teaming up now with other asset managers across the country, activist groups such as the SEIU, the Teamsters, Greenpeace, the Sierra Club, and then you have state actors. You have um, the comptroller of the state of New York. You have pension funds, not just in California, but in Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, um, New York State. So you have state actors. You have pension funds. You have foundations. You have activist groups all working together and asset managers. So they give it a veneer of being pro you know, business that because they have asset managers working with them and that there's a state interest, so there's a government interest, and they all work together hand in glove to achieve this result. Um, and look, we just, we need to start building out the tools. Uh, we need to start engaging corporate America in the exact same ways. And with, you know, a shoestring budget, we've managed at the Free Enterprise Project to affect a lot of positive change in corporate America. Um, but it's, you know, one step forward, 10 steps back, unless there's more that come alongside me in what we're doing. Do you find that the people that are actually running these companies, now Jeff Bezos is the founder, owner, and so is Jack Dorsey, but there are other cases where these are big companies and the CEO is hired to make money for the company. And generally speaking, it's been my experience with big business persons uh, that they really do uh, care about the bottom line more than anything. Are you finding that there are some still, uh, this is the last question quickly, that there are still some rock-solid CEOs who are fighting this? There are becoming less and less, I'll just put it that way. From when I started to where we are now, the, 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 the weak knees are taking over because the pressure is just too much from the left. Yeah. Well, we have a lot of work to do. And, of course, uh, Justin, I could say to you and to my audience, we also know that uh, uh, the, the left, as powerful as they are, are up against a, a greater force, and that's the God that we serve, and he's the God of all truth. And uh, that uh, as, as well as they may be doing now, in the end, uh, it's they can't prevail. But we, meanwhile, have to do something. And Justin is doing some heroic things, and so it would be good if those of us that have stocks and uh, own uh, shares and companies would also join this effort. Justin Danhoff, thank you for joining me this morning. This is Sandy Rios in the morning on AFR Talk.